Hi, I want to talk today about uh, a topic that's a little bit difficult, uh, but I want to talk about basic rotor parameters. So we're talking about what is actually happening inside the rotor of a squirrel cage induction motor, uh, three-phase motor, right? So we're talking about uh, voltage and current and things that are actually getting induced into that rotor from that spinning, uh, rotating magnetic field in the stator. Uh, so we're just going to kind of draw this graph and talk about a couple different things. Uh, what this graph has is slip. So we're talking about uh, our 0% slip would be basically our uh, synchronous speed up there, right? And then we would have no load speed, really, really close, right? Like 2 to 5 RPM uh, away from sync. And then we would have our full load speed pretty close there as well, right? We usually talk about two to 8% slip for that full load. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about how that rotor is from what we would call down here a blocked rotor, right? Blocked rotor meaning it is stopped. There's a 100% slip. The uh, synchronous speed is whatever it is. Rotor is not spinning at all. So that's our slip as we kind of travel down, right? As you would add load you would have more load down here and then less load over here, right? With our no load and our synchronous speed. Uh, this side right here is going to just be our rotor values, right? So our minimum and then a maximum. So when we're talking about the rotor, uh, something really, really important to keep in mind is that our resistance of the rotor, the actual resistive value, physical property, is going to be constant throughout, right? So that resistance is constant, right? It's that physical property. We've got the end rings shorting out the end of the rotor bars, creating that low impedance path for current to flow inside the rotor. So now what we want to talk about is everything that's getting actually induced into the rotor. All right, so we're going to induce a couple things. We have that spinning magnetic field going around the rotor. Because our rotor has resistance and impedance, there's a path for current to flow. So we're going to get current to flow. But let's start with the uh, voltage, right? So we're going to induce a voltage into the rotor. Now that voltage, right, is going to be based on relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field. So the magnetic field is our spinning rotor field. So if we think about how in, uh, induction works, more relative motion, I'm going to get that more induced voltage. So here at 100% slip, my stator spinning at whatever it is, my rotor is not moving, that is a lot of relative motion. So my voltage is going to follow a trajectory, oops, let's get that a little better, all right, kind of like that. Right, so my voltage of my rotor decreases as my slip uh, decreases as well. Right, so and we would actually call those directly proportional. Right, so the more or the less slip, the less uh, voltage I'm going to have. Uh, we have our reactance of our rotor. Right, so we're going to have inductive reactance inside that rotor. Right, based upon the frequency of the rotor um, as well. Uh, so we're going to have that, so we're going to have reactance of the rotor, which we are also going to call directly proportional reactance of the rotor. We are going to have a frequency induced inside that rotor as well, right? A sine wave being produced because of the interaction going around. Now these three values, my voltage, frequency, and reactance, we all consider directly proportional. So we would just take our whatever our blocked rotor value is, and times the percentage of slip, or sorry, not times the percentage, times the slip, and that's going to give us those values. The other two things that are happening in the rotor, well, because we have reactance and we have resistance, we are also going to end up with an impedance inside the rotor. If I have voltage and I have impedance and I have that path, I'm also going to end up with a current inside the rotor. So now, these two, they are proportional to slip, but they're not linear. They're not directly proportional. So you're going to see them waver throughout the uh, graph a little bit.
right? So we've got voltage, impedance, frequency, current, and reactance all on that downward trend as we have less slip. Something else that's changing inside that rotor as we go is we are actually seeing our power factor. Sorry. inside that rotor changing, right? And that power factor of the rotor is typically based upon the resistance of the rotor and the impedance of the rotor, right? So that's important to remember. It would actually be increasing as those values go down because they're going down kind of at different rates. Um, so what I call this, or what we call this, is the easy fix chart, just as a quick kind of memory tool, easy fix just to kind of remember basically what's happening inside of a rotor. There is, however, one really, really important thing that happens along this as well, is the torque that is being produced by a motor. So the torque being produced by a motor is based upon the active current, right? So the torque is based upon the active current. Our active current is the current that is actually doing the work, it is just the rotor current times the power factor of the rotor. It's the in-phase current. Now that graph looks very, very different depending on the rotor type, which uh, we can discuss in some different videos. But sometimes it will often look something like this, or it goes down and then peaks and then kind of comes down pretty sharp there down at the end, right? So you get a peak torque somewhere along the way. It's not at full load. It's definitely not at sync somewhere along the way, right? So a torque graph could look something like that, but again, they vary quite a bit depending on the motor. Uh, I hope this was really helpful uh, for the basics of rotor parameters. Thanks for watching.